Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. Um, today we're diving um, kind of back in. We've, we've touched on this topic a little bit, but we're going to dive a little deeper into the um, the data side and the IIoT side. But we're going to be talking ultrasound and the IIoT and your guide to using ultrasound for remote monitoring. So pretty exciting topic. Um, if you've been um, on some of these webinars, we've been doing kind of around this, um, you'll know that you know, we've recently launched some new products. Um, so we'll touch on those a little bit, but um, it's a pretty exciting time for us here at UE Systems. Uh, in addition to some new products, we've also got uh, new team members. So um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Blair Frazier. Uh, he's been doing webinars with us for years and attending our conferences and things like that. But now he gets to do it with UE Systems on his shirt um, and on his business card. So Blair joins us as our um, Director of Global IIoT Solutions. So we're really excited about that. And this will be, as he said, kind of his coming out party. So um, it's official now that Blair is with us and we're happy to have him. So before I turn things over to uh, Blair, just another reminder, um, again, those of you that have been listening in, the last few weeks, you know, we're, you know, really pushing that even though we, in, while we're starting to be able to get back in, in person with folks, you know, there's still a lot of um, virtual conversations happening. And, um, you know, we definitely don't want you to think we're just because we're not in your plant that we're not available. Um, so if you have any software needs or um, any training, things like that, that you want to um, get some help from us on. We are happy to to set up go to meetings or Zooms or whatever and, and and do that with you. So just don't forget that. And um, hopefully some of you will be able to start seeing us um, face to face here soon. So we're looking forward to that. But of course, you know, safety first. Um, so as with all of our webinars that we do, we are recording this, and I'll I'll put it up on our YouTube channel um, later today. Um, so you will be able to access it that way if you have to hop off early or if you've got a colleague that uh, you wanted to have hear this message today. Um, and then, of course, if you want to go back and listen to any of the other ones that we've been doing, they're, they're all available. Um, we definitely welcome questions. Um, I know we've got at least one poll question, so we're going to try and interact a little bit with you guys. Um, but definitely feel free to type those questions in and, and we'll get those tossed over to Blair uh, so he can answer those for you. And as I say every week, you know, just ignore any crazy craziness you might hear. Um, I don't know, public like run day 500 of this quarantine, but um, the kids are starting to starting to get the hang of mommy being on webinars all the time. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll stay quiet and the dogs will behave. But if not, just bear with me. And and of course, if we have any audio issues or any technology issues, we'll get those fixed as quick as we can. And with that, Blair, I'm going to turn the screen over to you, and we'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you, Maureen. Good. Well, yes, thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to join this webinar. Um, as Maureen said, um, I am new in terms of working with UE Systems, um, but I've done a lot of work with UE Systems in my past lives, and that's why it was just a, a natural fit. And, and as you can see from um, those, these webinars, and in particular these ones, as we talk about uh, two new products that you might not be aware of, um, we're, we're really investing a lot of our time, resource, and effort into um, developing um, IoT solutions to really be the leader in, in, in IoT for ultra, ultrasound solutions. So stay tuned for some, some uh, further products, further developments, further enhancements that are coming down the pipeline as well. And as I walk through um, this, this webinar today, um, we're, we're going to hit a lot of points. And there is going to be a ebook coming out shortly that is going to address these points in more detail. And um, I, I, I've hit some of the, the highlights, I think, that are important when we're looking at considering ultrasound IoT systems and, and, and more importantly, where this fits into the, um, the ecosystem of IoT. Um, and um, you know how you can start a pilot project, not fall into what's being now called pilot purgatory, and and, and really get value out of that and scale these these systems up. So we're gonna we're gonna hit a lot of a lot of key points. And again, just because it's an hour webinar, um, I could probably do a series of these um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so there is going to be some points I skip over, maybe go over fast that you may want to dive deeper in. And um, I think what we'll do there is just uh, drop us a question 
Um, we'll try to answer what we can on this webinar, but if not, feel free to reach out to me and we can, we can tackle certain issues you may have or questions one-on-one. -on -one. So when we look at IIoT, IIoT, the industrial internet of things, um, a lot of us think it looks like this, right? When we talk about remote monitoring, this is what we picture in our head. It, it may come from you know, our, our background, depending on how old you are from Star Trek and things like that, right? Is, is we, we picture this world of connected devices. And, and I think that's great to think about that. And, you know, literally you can get your, your um, microwave and fridge to be an IoT device, but without providing insights, without providing actionable insights, what's it really telling you? Um, and, and I'd challenge anyone that's putting these devices in is, is what, what are you trying to achieve? And, and what's being said is that data is the new gold. And I, I think, you know, I think in holistically, I think that's um, specifically as it leans to uh, manufacturing or industrial, I think that's true for the most part. Um, but studies show, and, and this number is actually going up, it's actually trending in the wrong direction that 73% 73 of, 73 of, of data goes unused for analytics. So we're not using this data. So if I go back to here, there's all this data is coming up to us and, and we have data. Um, and in fact, manufacturing generates twice as much data as, as government um, in, in the United States. So you can see how much data we're actually generating, but yet we're not using that data. And, and what I would say is that Data is not necessarily the new gold. Data is a means, it's the raw material to get us insights. Insights in terms of, of predictive maintenance, if you want to call it that, or operational excellence is really the new gold. Data is just the raw material we need to analyze. We need to um, be able to put it in a format that we can understand it. We can do something with it. Again, it's just like when alarm management standards came out decades ago from SCADA systems or DCSs. What is an alarm? Alarm is anything you have to take action on. And I think we need to put that same methodology into how we're looking at IoT systems and the ecosystems of what are we trying to do with this data? And what are we trying to get out of these insights from the data we're generating? So most of you are probably already familiar with, with the power of ultrasound, and I'm probably not the best person to go over this um, in terms of the technical aspect of it, but really what I like about ultrasound, and I've been known to ruffle a few feathers and even said this about three years ago, and I said, I do believe that ultrasound is going to be one of the prominent data generation techniques feeding IIoT systems. And specifically, when we look at that P to F curve from a bearing or rotating piece of equipment, you know, it doesn't matter who made up that P to F curve. Um, ultrasound is typically one of the first or the, the uh, earliest identifiers of what's called incipient or the early onset of failure. So where it naturally sits on that P to F curve is really going to drive, I think, its use case in IoT or advanced analytic systems. And, and what's great about ultrasound is that by its nature, by its design, it comes data optimized. And, and I'll, I'll get more detail into that. So when we look at it, and, and again, this is the same, doesn't matter if it's, if it's our handheld, our ultra probes, or our online remote monitoring systems, it's the same um, methodology that's been proven by many research papers, by many industry standards. And what's great about this is there's, there's this buzzword going around. It's not actually a buzzword. It does mean something called um, prescriptive, prescriptive analytics or prescriptive insights. And what that's telling you, instead of, instead of just giving you an alarm saying this, this cross this threshold, it's prescriptive into what are you going to do about that? What action are you going to take? And that's really what we want to get out of these IoT systems. It's not just to, you know, to generate more data we're not going to use. And yes, we can create some fancy dashboards with data changing and things popping up like I shown in that mock-up, but really what, what action are we gonna take? And what's great about ultrasound is the proven methodology around taking a baseline reading. In this case, it's a bearing example I'm using, is you take that baseline reading and there's a known threshold. If it increased over eight decibels over top of that baseline, that indicates a lack of lubrication. So we can imagine when you're putting this into, um, you know, it's easy to think about from one bearing perspective, 
But really what we're seeing is the onset of IoT is really going to um, cover a lot of our equipments and assets in our facility. So now we take that concept of prescriptive alerts instead of saying, hey, this, this bearing crossed eight decibels over baseline. Instead, what it's going to do is give you a prescriptive alert saying, you know, chances are there's indicates a lack of lubrication in this bearing. Right. And it's very prescriptive. Obviously, if it's indicating a lack of lubrication, what you should probably do with it is go lubricate it. Right. And then we start to see that number increase as the incipient fault starts to build in, in these systems. Right. So 16 decibels over that baseline indicates it's a failure mode beyond lubrication alone. And then as we get over that 35 decibels, that's really critical. And it doesn't necessarily give us a remaining useful life, but what you'll see in the analytic portion of these online monitoring systems is we get to watch that degradation, the amount of risk that is happening to that piece of equipment and its change over time. So how quickly is that changing? So yes, you know everyone wants to get to how long do I have left? And um, if you've had heard me talk on, on, on other forums, I, I'm big into advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, and I love this concept of remaining useful life. Um, but I think we need a lot of data and a lot of proven failure modes to get to that. And I think this is a natural step to get there in that we can watch that the rate of rise of how this decibel reading is changing to give us really prescriptive insights. And what's also great, as I said, you know, ultrasound is, is data optimized. So ultrasound's emission are directional. So you can see where we have, this is our 750 sensor installed, is by nature, it's one overall value. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a very good leading indicator of something happening in that bearing in terms of identifying lubrication issues and as well as the onset or incipient fault in terms of that bearing health, right? So since we're not concerned about axis or direction of how that um, acoustic value is going, it's one sensor, right? One sensor, one value right whereas if you start to look at scale of things right if you have to deal with axes you can literally have three times as much data on one bearing versus ultrasound so yes there are failure modes that ultrasound can't pick up and and i fully agree with that but in terms of an early warning indication it's very data optimized um, from that aspect and because we're dealing with ultrasound it, it tends to be highly localized and sensors can be used in loud noisy environments so we're not picking up that surrounding noise that may influence the ultrasound signal and if you've ever used our handheld specifically for leak detection and things like that you can clearly see how ultrasound is very good at pinpointing certain frequencies and ignoring the rest of the general noise inside of industrial facilities so how is ultrasound data optimized out of the box? So as I mentioned, it's a, a meaningful leading indicator. So the output of decibels is a great leading indicator of lubrication and bearing faults. It's a quantitative value, provides actual insights. There's no inter interpretation or analytics needed. Um, and no offense to anyone on this call, but the way it's been described to us in terms of our remote monitoring and how these insights are generated, um, it's, was, it was quoted as being, it is so simple management can understand it, right? And we need to just respect and really what that person meant was that uh, a person that doesn't necessarily have the training in, in ultrasound or the technical training, um, that might be more of a money person or something like that can still understand what's happening because the decibel is such a great leading indicator of lubrication and bearing issues. And since we're dealing with one sensor, can cover entire bearing, um, less data, needs to be generated per bearing. And that really starts to matter as you start to generate more and more and more data, right? Everyone is going out there and, and trying to capture your data, trying to store your data and do things with this data. And I'm a firm believer in, it's not necessarily more data is good. It, it, the way I look at it, if anyone's ever used crazy glue, less is not always more, right? And if you've used it, you know exactly what I'm saying. Um, more is not always the best, right? So with crazy glue, you want a thin layer of application. And if you keep on putting a lot of crazy glue on something, it becomes less and less sticky, right? And generating data for the sake of generating data is, is not going to help our cause with these IoT systems we're putting in place. And when we look at it, when we designed our systems and, and IoT is, is definitely taking over, um, you know, what we're going to see is whatever you want to call it, maintenance 4.0, or industry 4.0 smart manufacturing 
there's a lot of buzzwords you can put into this is when we design these systems is you know what what's typically going to happen and what we're seeing and there might be some of you on this call that from a corporate perspective or they've actually um created a digital team within an organization to look at systems to build the systems in cohesiveness with other other partners and other plants in a, in a corporate or enterprise environment and that's great and we're also seeing another aspect of it which i call random acts of digitalization which is is these solo projects being put in right without necessarily um corporate approval or your or your kind of you know um fake it till you make it so put a system in prove the value then go to corporate and say hey look what i've been doing look what i'm able to get let's scale this across right and in both have their advantages i'm not saying one's good with another but what's really important when you're looking at these iot systems is you know there almost seems to be a new vendor of an iot system which which um, they want to call a master to, master of record, which means they want to not only capture, say, process data, they want to capture the condition monitoring data, the CMS data, and I think that's great. I think those systems have a purpose and, and should do that. The challenge is with everyone wanting to be that IoT ecosystem, that master of record, how do these puzzle pieces fit together? And when we developed our product line within our IoT or remote monitoring, business is we designed it to be a puzzle piece that is meant to easily and non-intrusively fit in to the existing IoT ecosystem so that it's just a puzzle piece going in so we're not meant to be that master of record nor do we want to be we want to be a good puzzle piece for great data generation of the health of your bearings of your electrical equipment and feed that into if we have to into an existing IoT ecosystem. Yes, this puzzle piece can stand on its own, but it also plug in natively into your existing IoT ecosystem. And I really think that's going to win because what we've seen and industry rightfully so is always lacking behind other industries. And we've seen this and COVID-19, I think is really pushing this forward around connectivity, the use of data in healthcare. Um, we've seen it in financial tech or FinTech. Um, we've also seen it in our daily lives. We've seen it in, in as I mentioned, you can get your, your um, uh, refrigerator, your garage door opener and your toaster all on IoT systems. But what's interesting is that these systems are standalone and uh, like the likes of Google and things like that are acquiring other companies and building their own ecosystems so your security camera can talk to your front door, right? Which I think makes sense. What we don't want, and I think that's a big caution when we're looking at IoT systems, are these siloed data spots, right? Where it's, it doesn't fit into the bigger picture. So what I would like, and, and I use an analogy in your home life, is we have smart garage door openers where you can open and close your garage door um, with your phone. And if you heard, heard me do this presentation, is I bought one of those because I'm an IoT guy. I'm, I'm a geek when it comes to technology. So yes, I paid an extra hundred dollars so I could open and close my garage door with my remote or my phone. Um, but that system is not talking to my my vehicle, right? Which has the capability. And yes, you can write some Python script and things like that to geofence it in and, and people have done it, but it's not out of the box. And what I would like is that when I start my vehicle up in the morning, my garage door automatically opens up. Those are the connectivity, connectivity things we're looking for. So we don't have you know, a, an own, our own IoT system for our fridge, or our own IoT system for our toaster. They're all built together to talk and communicate. So what we've done is we built a standalone system that can easily integrate into your existing IoT ecosystem. Even if it's not an IoT ecosystem, it can still go into OSI Pi, IP21, your SCADA systems and things like that. So when we look at the portfolio, and I encourage everyone when you're looking at remote monitoring or online solutions, to look at it from a criticality point of view. So how critical is the asset you're monitoring? And it's not um, an exact science here. It doesn't mean you could not put a, what a forecast device is, and I'll get into what it is on non-essential run to failure equipment. By all means, if you can justify it, then that makes sense. Um, but generally speaking, not all solutions are created equal, right? And there's different reasons why assets are critical. So if you take, for example, the criticality, you know, it's, it's easy to say this asset or this piece of equipment to me is very critical, critical because if it fails, it causes so much downtime. And that's great, right? That to me warrants an online solution. 
But an asset, when you look at asset criticality and you're doing an asset criticality, there's many factors that go into not just the, 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 the production or quality impact, but there's also um, health and safety impact, environment impact. So you may have a piece of equipment that is redundant, right? So if it fails, you can, you can start up another one, right? Which reduces the impact on uh, production and quality. But from a safety point of view, right? Um, again, we're across a lot of industry. So there's some, some uh, pretty harsh environments out there that are processing things that you would not want to get in contact with. It's a redundant piece of equipment, but because of what it's doing and the safety concerns, it then becomes critical. So then that warrants a solution that you never have to put someone in harm's way to go collect, analyze, and dig deeper into issues. Right. Whereas we look at that essential and essential, a lot of people call this balance of plant. And I would agree those essential assets, right? The critical assets can, can amount to between five to 10% the different distributions based on industry of how, uh, how much assets within our facility are critical. So you even if we use the high number of 10%, what about the other 90% of those assets, right? Can, can we develop solutions? Is it, is it feasible? Is it, is it economical to deploy online monitoring solutions on these essential assets? And I really think, you know, in industry as a whole, we've been doing a great job of putting online systems on our critical equipment, but as now as, as, as costs are going down, sensor costs are going down, technology is, is getting better and better. We can start to consider covering are essential or balance of plant assets in the tens, hundreds, thousands of assets, very economically with different types of solutions. And you may complement those with an online solution and an ultra probe, so route based. And you know, when you get to that non-essential run to failure or, or do a, a monthly, weekly, yearly, whatever it is, ultra probe route based um, plan in place. And you know, a lot of people come to me because I do speak passionately about you know the, the future of where technology is heading and where it's going to go. Um, I'll be the first one to say I do not believe that route based is going away. And the reason is that it still serves a great purpose. Um, it can help offset the cost because with each different solution, there's a different cost point depending on what it's doing. If you can never access that point because of safety or criticality point of view of that asset, then you need to make sure you can capture every piece of data and be able to analyze that without ever stepping foot. When you go down to an essential asset, um, you may you may still be able to have access to that. So you just want a good leading indicator of something that's going wrong, and then you put a, um, an ultra probe in place. Um, so when we look at um, considerations for the cost benefit ratio, what we're looking at here is, so as I said, with critical assets, it's it's easy to justify the return on investment with your most critical assets because we've been on so many calls and done so many of these projects where it, it makes a lot of sense for saying, hey, this is my most critical asset. And you know, chances are you don't need a, a long study to figure out which one is critical. You can, most people can point it out. It's that piece of equipment right there. Right? It becomes a lot easier to justify that return. It does make for a great um, pilot project to start with because it's so critical and everyone knows probably that asset by its tag name. Um, when you get to the essential assets, it becomes a little difficult because we're starting to look at, you know, the majority of pieces of equipment, right? And how do you start to justify an ROI? And you may have done that with your route base, with the ultra probe, if you're using that as a technique um, to, to do condition monitoring of these equipment. But how do you justify that? Because, you know, the impact on production and quality might not be as high. So the, 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 the assets to me really warrant the solution you're trying to get to. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna ask you a question and uh, in a minute, Maureen is going to pull up a poll. And I, I truly do wanna, I'm, I'm, before I give you my opinion on this, I wanna know out there generally if you agree with this statement. So even without identifying the exact cause of a fault, there is great value in simply identifying that maintenance is required therefore avoiding catastrophic failure and potential for secondary damage. So what we're saying in there is you don't necessarily know the exact cause of a fault, but there's still value in saying, hey, and if you use a bearing as an example, something is going wrong with this bearing, right? Is there still value in knowing that, identifying that maintenance is required? 
Maureen, if you don't mind just pulling up that poll, I would love to see what's going to happen. Yep. There it is. <clears throat> we'll give folks a couple seconds here to chime in. A little bit more participation, and so it looks like the, the percentages are going to stay the same. So you're at about 92% agreeing, and then Hey. Disagree. Well, go. I took a chance there because we would have to end the webinar if, if people didn't agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my first UE webinar, and I only, well, that's the end of the webinar, so it's still great. No, and, and, and I agree too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, everyone that, that did vote. Uh, I appreciate that. And I, I, I fully agree. And, and that doesn't mean there's not a place for systems that, you know, that are, there to identify the exact root cause, right? But when we're looking at balance of plan, and, this, and it comes back to that action or the do part of an IoT system, what are you gonna do with that? And if I tell you, or a system tells you that a bearing is start to fail in your, based on your reliability and maturity is, I go and I put in a new bearing. I throw the bearing out and I put in a new bearing and I wait for that one to fail and I put a new one, in, which is fine, right? That's where you're at. Um, then I think that makes a lot of sense, right? But if you have a system where you need to make sure, um, you know, you want to get to the exact as an inner race defect or, or whatever it is in terms of a bearing, then you need a different system in place. And each one of those system has a different value, but of course has a different cost point, right? And when we're talking about if anyone just starts to think of, you know, you have to say count on your fingers, but you're running out of fingers pretty quickly, the amount of bearings you have in your facility, that cost, even if it's just a few dollars per point or a hundred dollars per point more, really starts to add up as you think of scaling these IoT systems. So justification for mechanical. So what I'm talking about right now is mechanical. We will get into electrical, which again, I think electrical is a lot easier to justify. But when we're looking at mechanical, so um, eliminate premature bearing failure through ultrasound guided lubrication. And we'll get into how how a benefit around ultrasound guided lubrication is in terms of saving your bearings, right? So what we want to do in general is not just know when maintenance is required, but also do everything we can to proactively manage that bearing to make sure we get the desired amount of life out we can. And reduce the resource requirements to take manual route data. Um, the reality is we find that um, you know a lot of time is spent taking manual data, which is good because when you do manual inspection, you get to see things, smell things, sometimes touch things that you don't get to see with online systems. And that's another reason why I believe that route-based or, or offline manual collection is not going to go away. But it doesn't mean we have to get out to that asset every month, right? So look at if you're doing routes right now, how much time do you spend? And typically, you know, the person that analyzes the data that understands the piece of equipment is also that same person that's collecting that data. So here we are, we're paying someone with a very high skill set to walk around, right? Great for exercise, great to get your steps in if you have a Fitbit, but not necessarily great from, you know, a wrench time point of view. And of course, provide the earliest warning of bearing failures from a mechanical point of view. So when you start to build an ROI or justification, if you can put a dollar value for each one of these, right? What does it mean if I extend my bearing life by a few years? What does it mean if if I make them up, Joe or Susan doesn't have to do route-based anymore and they're just focusing on those few bearings that actually have a problem? And what if we can identify a bearing failure before it actually takes production down or operations down and we can properly plan for it? What does that mean? Um, and, and what we find and what's interesting from the mechanical side is a bearing, you know, can be as, as cheap as $50, for example, but it's that secondary damage. And I put that in that poll question around, you know, uh, you know, putting people in, in, in danger, the secondary damage of, of, of a product lost or product quality. Uh, often, you know, just an hour of dime, down, downtime can be as 25 to 50,000. And, and it could be even more depending on your industry, right? Um, so I think it becomes very attractive to start monitoring things in real time. But what we're doing to this, traditionally with our route base is we're going around and we're collecting data on good working bearings, right? But we have to do that because if we do it any 
more than a month, we may miss that failure mode. We may miss that PDF curve completely, right? So we have to, we're forced to, but on average, 80 to 90% of those bearings are good, right? So we're spending time, we're collecting data, we're walking up to that piece of equipment, we're saying, yes, this is good, right? So think about how many bearings you have. Think about those 20 to, to 10 to 20% of bearings, right? that actually warrant some kind of, 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 of additional analysis of, of, of capturing that audio file, of diagnosing it, right? It's a very few number, right? But here we are, we're letting the, we're letting the bearing schedule us versus us schedule the bearing. So imagine a system that's going to flag you when those 10 to 20% starts to flag and then can go out there and if you need to capture additional um, data, go out and start to collect it with an ultra probe or other techniques. And this goes to the proactive side. So if, if what we're trying to do is just capture, um, know when things start to fail, that that's one portion of it, but how do we get proactive? How do we extend that life? And, you know, it, it, there's very industry studies and, and they come back somewhere around this number, um, around how lubrication is the number one cause of bearing failure. So it's very simple when you're dealing with that 80-20 rule is if you start to address lubrication alone, right, you can start to extend that bearing life. You can deal with those premature failures, right? So here's a system, it's, it's the on track we're gonna talk about as one of the systems that's going to not only guide you in lubrication, the same as your ultra pro board or your grease caddy would, but also monitor in real time so you can you can know that you're applying the right amount of grease or you've over greased it, but also start to indicate when that bearing starts to fail. So I'm not gonna go through this because um, there's gonna be webinars and I'm sure we've done a lot on, on um, ultrasound guided um, lubrication, but these are some of the benefits, what happens when you start to use them, right? And that really to me, it's the longer motor and bearing life and the better overall reliability. Right? Those are the two main points when you start to use systems to guide you into there. And here's an interesting part. So when it comes to electrical systems, can you go through your facility? And if you've done a criticality, um, what we see is a completely different distribution of criticality rankings of equipment when it comes to electrical equipment. Not too many facilities have redundant main transformers. Now they do exist, and, and I'm sure there's many here on this call today that have them, right? But we don't often see that distribution in terms of like electrical equipment, majority of them are all critical. You're not going to put a secondary MCC bucket in or a secondary switch gear in, right? Um, so it becomes very um, easy to help justify that return on investment or that cost benefit ratio. And, and what studies have found the average cost for electrical asset failure is greater than 500,000 per event and with less than 5% of critical assets having continuous monitoring installed. So you start to think of those pinch points, those failure points within your facility. Yes, you know, a bearing failure is a problem, but if you don't have electricity to spin that bearing, um, then it doesn't matter anyways, right? So when we look at it from a solution point of view, we put it into buckets. So we not only do we have our critical, essential, and non-essential um, assets, but also by function. So bearing and lubrication, we have the foresight, which is a continuous online 24, um, 24 seven monitoring system for bearing and lubrication issues. And then for essential assets, we have the on track. And then for electrical, we, oh, I missed those around, sorry. We have the foresight and we have the ECM, right? And everyone has sensors obviously. And then for manual inspections, we have the, we have the ultra probes. So what I want to do is take a look at the ECM 586. It's the electrical cabinet monitor. And what it's meant is to be designed inside of a cabinet, right? It's a standalone product, right? So it doesn't really fit into an ecosystem. The way it works is it provides a four to 20 milliamp um, sensor. So it's an airborne ultrasound application that's designed to mount inside your cabinet and it's just always listening. And it's sending out a proportional um, signal um, to that airborne ultrasound in a four to 20 amp milliamp sensor, right? So you start to see the scale and how this gets used, right? Because it's standalone, it's one point, it's one system. When we start to look at the more advanced solutions from this, we get into the foresight and the forecast. So the foresight is a continuous monitoring system for electrical equipment or electrical cabinets. 
and the forecast is a continuous monitoring system for lubrication and bearing issues. They look the same because we want a consistency across them, but the the guts, the insides, is a little different because if you know ultrasound, you need to, to, to tune in specifically to different frequencies when you're trying to detect these problems. So the forecast and foresight. Again, these are for your more critical assets. So what does it do and how does it do it? So it continually monitors and listens 24-7, 365. Right, so once it's installed, it's monitoring those bearings, it's monitoring that equipment. And this, this these systems are further data optimized. So the way it works is it stores the reading on board. So, so what we don't want to do is generate data for the sake of generating data. So this system resides on your, your, your network, your existing network system, and it's always listening at the edge. So the sensors are, are wired to a box with a RAS sensor, which I'll get into, and it's always listening. It never takes its ear off that bearing or in that electrical cabinet. Only when there's an issue does it then start to send data or on predetermined intervals. It can capture that overall decibel levels and the sound wave file. So that sound wave file is the reason I asked that initial question is just knowing the maintenance is required, is it required? So to send that um, sound wave file, um, it, obviously the sound wave files are dense amount of information requires a different way of sending that data and analyzing that data. So this really what sets the forecast and foresight off against the on track and the ECM, which I discussed, which are just dealing with overall decibel levels, which are a great indication that something is going wrong, a leading, leading indicator, right? So the way the system works is it captures that data's listening based on predetermined intervals or past a certain threshold, it's then going to send that data out. So just like our toaster or our fridge, what we don't wanna do is, is bog down network infrastructure. We start and, and like McKenzie comes up with a study and, and everyone else come up with a study of like 4 trillion, I'm making that number up of IoT sensors are going to be installed in the next 10 years, right? So what we don't want to do is, is bog down our network infrastructure so bad that we can't get on webinars like this because we're sending what presumably could be good data across our network. So it's very optimized to send that data only when needed, only when certain thresholds are, are met. So the way the forecast works is we have RAS sensors and RAS sensors are stand for remote access sensors. And if anyone is using these for uh, our handheld ultra probes are the exact same sensor that may go back to a switch box that you can then um, connect your, your ultra probe to. Those same RAS sensors get wired into our forecast box. That box then is doing, that box is doing majority of, of the work in terms of analyzing, capturing that and, and storing that data. And what it does is it sends that data out either through a hardwired Ethernet connection or you can use what's called a wireless bridge and bridge that wirelessly and send that data back to DMS. And if you're familiar with DMS, it gives you the ability to set the forecast system up. So how frequently you want to capture data, set your alarm thresholds. So everything's done through DMS software. Of course, you know, when we're looking at, at condition bonding data in particular, we're looking at repeatable signals over time. Right, so what you want to do is you want to trend that data, and you're able to do that in in the DMS software. Instead of if you if you use DMS for a route base, um, using ultra probes, um, it's the same interface you would use to look at viewing that data and looking at those trends. And of course, because it's the forecast system, and we're able to grab those audio files and send that over when needed, we can look at the spectrums and do more analysis into the exact causes of that. Now, when we get into the foresight, it's the exact same system except um, instead of using a structure-borne ultrasound, we're using an airborne ultrasound, which is meant to get installed inside of electrical cabinet, right? So we are dealing with different frequencies in terms of using the foresight and forecast. But in terms of how that data flows is exactly the same, and it's, it's around being optimized. The only difference is with electrical applications, the, the, the faults are truly hidden in that, um, that audio file in terms of uh, corona tracking, arcing, right? So you really need um, those, those audio files to do analysis to determine what it is. 
So the way the forecast and foresight works is you have alarm levels and you, and you, you configure all this through um, the DMS software. Right, so you can set your threshold limits, and just like the OnTrack system that we're going to talk about as well, it has the ability um, to have conditioned alarms, so you're not going in and out of alarms and things like that. So you're not getting constantly cry wolf syndrome of your alarms. It has to cross a certain threshold for so long and things like that. So everything's done in terms of measuring that um, with the DM DMS software itself. Um, and, and this is really where IOC, IOT systems are coming in and I've seen it and we've created a great dashboard, um, you know, for our products as well. Um, but what's happening is, you know, dashboards are great and I constantly have a dashboard up um, from some of our systems here because I like the look of it. It gives me that comfort ceiling of seeing these values change in real time. But the reality is these IOT systems have to be a push, right? So we can't be sitting there and looking at these alarm screens or these trends all day, every day, right? What we want to do is when a certain threshold is crossed, we want that alarm to come us, come to us, right? With, with test message or emails. And that's what's built into both the forecast and the foresight and the on track as well. This is what the trending looks like. So you can set up your low, high alarm decibel readings. Again, if you use DMS, I don't want to get in too deep into this, but it's the same way you would look at trending that information. And again, you can use our spectra analyzer to analyze the sound. Um, and again, it's a separate whole webinar if you want to get into to how to use that. But with the forecast and foresight, you can pull that audio file across and analyze that sound. And reporting. So everything you can do, you can export it into into reports. So you can include pictures, um, the 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 waveforms and things like that to create these reports to be able to send them off and and do other things. And if you have other plants, you can send them to other plants. And that brings us into one of our newer products, um, which is our our on track system. And this is for the essential or what you would call balance of plants piece of equipment. And it it's built using new technology in terms of the IO, I, I, OT side of things, but it's using the sensing technology that we've been around for decades. Some of you might be familiar with the UltraTrack 750, which is a permanent, always listening ultrasound transmitter. So it's a sensor transducer in one. But what we've done is we leverage the power of IoT and analytics to be able to put it in a complete solution, turnkey solution, to be able to offer our customers real-time lubrication and bearing insights 24-7. Um, if you're familiar with the UltraTrack 750, really what it was designed for was to fit into um, your existing SCADA system, your PLC system, your DCS system. Um, and and what we had is we've had a lot of success but what was happening was we have, our customers are having so much success they couldn't scale the plc systems or the dcs systems fast enough to include these sensors which really is what drove us to create a turnkey solution to be able to offer this that you can scale up easily and affordably so when we created the on track system we had three aspects we had to be able to address the first one is easy so not only from an installation point of view, but ease of use. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think we're going to have, and they call it the IT OT conversions. So IT is uh, information technology. OT is probably 99.99% of us on this call is, is we are OT. We're operational technology. We're those people on the floor. And those two meeting is an interesting um, interesting thing that's happening as IoT is becoming more because we, as from the OT side, we're connecting more and more stuff onto networks and sensors, right? So we needed to make sure that our puzzle piece fit in with the existing infrastructure so um, IT doesn't come with us to, with, a, with a bat and shut down our systems and things like that. But because we're dealing with essential or balance of plants types of equipment, it had to be scalable as well. And as I said, as we're generating more and more data from an IoT point of view, how do we make sure we can start and pilot a system that only has 16 points, but we can scale that up? We have a roadmap. We have a scalable roadmap to be able to look at monitoring, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of our balance of plan equipment. And because we're dealing with that, that number of points, 
unlike the the forecast and the foresight which are which are meant for your critical pieces of equipment and it's very easy to justify that ROI or that cost benefit ratio how do we do it on the balance of plan equipment that it might not have immediate impact on production if it fails but it's a pain in the butt because I got to get maintenance in here I got to go overtime or I got to switch lines and those types of things right so it had to be affordable from that point of view so what is the on track system it's an it's a 16 channel IIoT edge analytic device so wow there's a lot of buzzwords in there so we got iot edge analytic device and what's happened is we went into prototypes of the on track system with a few of our customers what was happening was um what we found the value of bringing the analytic capability the the, the computational power closer and closer and closer to the device as possible and what that's doing is eliminating the the data requirements on our network um, it's eliminating the, the amount of cable we have to run and things like that, right? All designed to deliver the earliest warning of bearing failure and lubrication issues, of course, all done remotely. And we have a saying inside of UE systems where we're talking about, uh, we define these times as pre-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID. And pre-COVID, IoT, you know, it was, it was a nice to have. Um, and what we're finding in there during COVID period is really, uh, you know the acceleration of these of these systems and the value of these systems because you know some of us can't get into our plants um we have to work off shifts so we're not there as many times um so really of uh, getting this information remotely at no point in time it, and um you know for, for my i have a ford f-150 um and i can i can start it with my phone right um if i can do that and you know this truck is you know whatever it is, $30,000, why, why do I have a piece of equipment that's probably worth $100,000, $200,000, but I can't see any information like I can on this vehicle, right? So really designed to be remotely. And the way this system works is we have the Ultratrack 750, and they get hardwired into our on-track IoT system, right? And the reason we hardwired these sensors and we can put other sensors in there as well, um, is we want the system to be maintenance free. So our, our UltraTrack 750 sensors come factory wired and sealed. They're in a stainless steel housing. These are what I call industrial proof. So when we talk about maintenance free, and we look at that total cost of ownership over time, is there is no battery to replace and they're hardwired. They're meant to, um, for lack of better terms, set it and forget it, right? So we're really um, trying not to, to have, we don't want to replace a failure mode or exchange a failure mode with a failure mode. We don't want to put on a sensor that has its own new failure mode to detect a bearing that has its own failure modes, right? And it gets wired into an, a, a, a pre-configured 16 channel system. And this is where the magic starts to happen. So as we said, we're, you know, we really meant this to be a puzzle piece fitting into the IoT ecosystem that's changing by the day. So how does data get sent out? It has three options. We can have ethernet, so a hardwired Ethernet connection sitting on your plant network or a dedicated VLAN to send this information out, similar to the foresight uh, and, and the forecast. We have two other options. We have Wi-Fi, which if you have a reliable Wi-Fi signal in your facility, we can send that out, which means the on-track, other than the, the sensors for the cables, the only other cable you would need to wire into this is a power feed to power this unit up. And if you go cellular, which is a great option if you're considering pilots or you have data security issues because we're just dealing with what I call pervasive sensing, non-intrusive sensing, we're not taking any intellectual property or anything like that, um, we can send that data out cellular. So we've partnered with the leading um, cell providers to be able to provision and use their SIM cards as part of their M M2M, machine to machine or IoT platforms. We can provision them right from our factory and ship them. So the minute you turn it on, it's sending data. And because data is optimized, um, we are on the lowest plans of these cell plans. It's not like we're streaming Netflix on a cellular card, right? It's the lowest plan possible on all of these carriers. And data natively gets sent to our real-time dashboard through our on-track cloud, which is a very intuitive, dashboard you would expect to see from a modern iot solution very customizable and you can do a lot of neat things of course it's not just meant for your laptop it's the same dashboard you see on a phone a tablet a big screen tv and of course still meant to be just like the forecast and the foresight meant to send alerts and notifications if you're not looking at that dashboard 24 7. 
So this is what the OnTrack system looks like. We've talked about the communication options. It's a modular 16 sensor system. That doesn't mean you have to use all 16 sensors. It's scalable. So if you only want to use eight, really the cost comes with the sensors, not the OnTrack system itself. Typically, it's cheaper and more cost effective to scale the OnTrack system than, is, than run a new sensor you know, 200 feet away. Um, again, everything's remind, designed to be that remote that I talked about that's very important in these IoT systems. But here's a little bit of, of another special sauce here. So we, we're quite proud of our OnTrack cloud uh, and the ease of use, the ability to view this information. But to put that puzzle piece into other IoT ecosystems is we understand that we are not the only IoT provider out there. And we are we're not monitoring, you know, other um, systems and things like that. So how do we fit that puzzle piece in other systems? We built in native web APIs or REST APIs, if you know that terminology. So we can natively send data if you're already using AWS or Microsoft or Azure, Google Cloud, um, PTC ThingWorks, IBM Watson, and you know you don't want data in different places, we can easily natively license free, send data to other systems, right? So we don't have to become that center of record. So you don't have those islands of information out there. And as I said, as our learning of developing and, and testing these products is, as I said, it's driving us closer and closer and closer to the pieces of equipment, which I think is great. And because it's meant to scale at the at the asset or assets plural, the classes of assets, is what we see is multiple on-track systems um, throughout plants or buildings. And because we're bringing it closer and closer, um, it requires few cables and installation time. And what we originally had was a base station, which was great, it served its purpose. But what we didn't get exposed to was the secondary costs of electricians to run conduit, run cable and tie wrap cables to, to pipes and accidentally to a steam line and melt the, melt the cable, those type of things, right? So we're limiting the amount of cable and installation time from your end as well. And as I said, so it's it's we designed it to be IT friendly, so we can play in that sandbox. And we have documentation about how the system works and security and things like that. Again, um, so we can natively send data to other platforms. We can send data to the cloud as an option. Very powerful, allows you the remote access to this information no matter where you are. Unfortunately, if you're on vacation, you can still see this data and get alerts. We also can send that data to an ultra trend DMS if you want to keep that data completely on premises. And for some reason, because of the nature of your business, you don't want to move data around. We have an on premises way of keeping that data within, you know, figure to your four walls of your facility, which really makes this product unique. So just like the forecast, the foresight, the data staying on premises, we can do that with this on track system as well. Now, if you do have a centralized historian, and because the ultrasound decibel reading is, is such a great leading indicator, we can also send that data if you have OSI Pi, IP21, Ignition SCADA system, um, an Emerson Delta V, um, things like that. We can also send that um, data there as well. So you're not limited just to one option. It's not one, hey, if, if this doesn't work for you, you don't want our cloud, we're taking our hardware and we're going home. That's not the case. It is optional. So when we look at the dashboards, Right, we spent a lot of time and effort using our intellectual property, working with customers to define how you view this. I was going to say data, but that would that would not be correct as per my interlude of this presentation. It's all about insights. How do we view the insights? So the way the on-track systems are managed, everything is meant to be managed at your desk or through this this dashboard. So you can manage all your on-track systems. You can set user access. You can deploy changes all over the air. Um, every piece of data is sent and is time stamped and saved in the database. Um, we have agreement with our cloud provider to be able to store that information. Data is never deleted because data is so optimized um, that we never have to delete data. And the way it works is data over a year old goes into cold storage, which may take you know 30 seconds to pull up a trend versus a second. But to me, that's that's a, a good trade-off to be able to keep that data. And of course, data is yours. You can export that data at any point in time. Um, bring it to a CSV file, import it in other platforms. And the dashboard is customizable. It's unlimited. So we give you a framework 
of how we think you'd want to view this, but there's no limitation to how many dashboards you create. Um, you can create a dashboard per plant, per piece of equipment. You can create watch watch lists, so bad actors that you want to keep an eye on. You can create unlimited number of dashboards. And this is really what I'm talking about from a prescriptive analytics point of view, is this is an example of our dial gauge. You can change the colors on it, but can you imagine looking at you know hundreds, thousands of pieces of equipment of bearings and a quick glance. And, and the, if you follow the automation or the instrumentation side of the world, there was a ISA standard came out around human centered design or HCD. And what it talked about was we're getting overwhelmed with the amount of colors and graphics we put on dashboards of things spinning and things like that. So this is very intuitive. Can you imagine even a, a non-technical person being able to look at an insight like this and saying, I want my arrow to be in the blue zone. Blue zone means a healthy bearing. As it starts to get to that lighter gray, indicates a lack, lack of lubrication. So you can look up and say, oh, look at that. I got one, two, three, four, five, six bearings that require lubrication, right? When you start to get in that darker gray and eventually to the black, that's that rate of rise where you want to start looking at in terms of how fast is that needle moving to you know, a very bad catastrophic failure. And of course, you, know, you can view real time and historical trends. Um, conditions alert. So like I talked about with the forecast or the foresight, we have those same conditional alerts. The last thing we want is a system to cry, well, hey, we've seen a spike. Well, that's because the piece of equipment was starting up or a lot of things around triggering. So we can trigger it. So to only view data, certain equipment is running. If you have a discrete type of device, like a crane or some, some conveyors that only run off so often, right? There's no point getting alarms when the thing is off. So we can do that type of conditional alerts. And I said, we can administrate it all or you can administrate it all from one dashboard. So you can create an arbitrarily deeply nested hierarchy representing your facility in terms of plants, um, locations, pieces of equipment, and assign different people to different um, groups so that they can view only the information that's um, required for them and their role. Um, in case of the starter kit, so we have a starter kit for the forecast, the foresight, and the on-track system. We've tried to package it up to get you know, these projects moving successfully and so it comes with an on-track system up to 16 sensors pre-configured from our factory uh, the way that we, we do that is each on-track has a unique identifier it's assigned to you your facility so when you power it up there is zero configuration you need to do you just need to epoxy those sensors onto the bearings um, pre-built dashboards to get you going of course you can edit it one year of the on-track cloud and this is what we call the customer success and we've been doing this for decades but we've really packaged it up in terms of we're here to make sure that these pilot projects that you do, and the study again is showing the number is heading in the wrong direction, that um, a lot of these, these IoT projects go into pilot purgatory and never move to a full on implementation. So we are here with you every step of the way from technical support and remote expert diagnostics is something we call our customer success package to help guide you every step of the way, whether it's IT security questions, um, you notice an increasing in trend in your decibels, you want us to uh, help analyze a, a, a sound file, we are here to make sure that this project is successful, at least everything we can do on our end. So. A lot of information. Um, what I'm going to ask is if there's anyone, and again, I had to keep it high level, and even if it's not related to our UE Systems product, um, if you want to bounce some ideas off me or get my thoughts or challenge me with anything I said, and I welcome it around IoT, um, feel free to reach out to me. And here's the reality. Um, I've been stuck inside now for like many of us. Um, I don't have a plant to go to, and I welcome any conversations, good, bad, <laughs> you name it. Um, please feel free to reach out to me um, anytime we can go over any one of these projects. If you want to dive into the dashboard and see what it looks like, play with it, we can do that. We can talk about applications. We can figure out how we can get a, get a pilot or at least get that learning um, journey started with you. So there's my email. Again, please reach out um, anytime for any discussion points. Um, I didn't leave much time here, Maureen. Um, and, and again, I could keep on talking if everyone wants to stay on the line for another eight hours, I could do that. But <laughs> is there any pressing questions that uh, came up as I fastly went through? Yeah, yeah so most of the questions um, are probably best answered offline because um, they relate kind of more individually to, to folks' circumstances and things like that. So um, we will follow up with, with you all um, offline. And as Blair said, you know, you've got his info there. You guys 
probably all have my email address. Um, so definitely reach out if you want to get a, um, you know, personalized session put together where we can talk through, you know, your particular um, needs um, and how some of these solutions might fit in and, and what would make the most sense. Um, so we definitely would love to, to set that up. Um, so in the interest of time and getting everybody off here um, at two, just want to um, throw up here that we um, are doing something kind of unique. Um, obviously, a lot of the in-person conferences um, and training events and things like that that we're used to participating in um, are all kind of going away, it seems like, for 2020. So we are working with um, Iridicio, RDI Technologies, Fluke, and of course, UE Systems, and we're going to be doing a virtual conference um, on July 16th um, called Leading Reliability. So um, look for some more information from that here very soon. Um, we're really excited to kind of give this a, a shot and, and provide some more training and, and content um, and the ability to kind of network and, and kind of have a, a virtual exhibit hall, things like that. So, um, you know, unique times call for unique uh, creative solutions. So we're we're looking forward to, to seeing how this goes. So, um, you know, make note of that and, and for sure you'll be seeing more information about it. We'll, of course, continue to do um, these webinars um, and you'll see some more information about those um, in the next couple of days as well. Um, with that, I'll just toss our contact information up here. Again, I did record this, so we'll have it up online um, later this afternoon. Any questions, anything that you guys need at all, just, just holler at us. Um, we're happy to help. Um, and Blair, thanks for the great information today. Welcome aboard. And with that, um, just hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Everybody stay safe and healthy, and we'll catch you guys later.